Before I get started, I need to offer a word of thanks to all of the tall people in the congregation. There are any number of people here tall enough that they could have uh, advanced the clock <clears throat> for daylight savings, but none of you have, which gives me an extra hour for this sermon, which I really appreciate. <clears throat> Don't scramble to do it all at once now. <clears throat> I don't know if you picked up one of these on the table in the foyer. If not, you can get one on the way out. Uh, this is an explanation of the sermons that we will be looking at over the next several weeks. Um, in January, the spiritual sword had an issue there uh, entitled... The faces or the church faces the future. And that issue of the spiritual sword contained 12 really, really well thought out and biblical articles about uh, what we as, what we face as the church. In reading those, I was so impressed with them that I suggested to our elders that it might be good for us to uh, utilize some of those ideas in the studies that we're looking at, uh, and they both uh, agreed, and I made up this little thing just to kind of let you know what we would be talking about on the various weeks to come. Now, let me make it clear. I plan to preach from God's Word, not from the spiritual sword, okay? We're only using that as a, uh, a kind of a, a prompt for some ideas for us to look at, but we will be uh, as always, preaching from God's Word. Just over a week ago, our president gave the annual State of the Union address. The actual state of our union was not mentioned at all. The state of our union is sin. We are extremely far from the righteousness that exalts a nation, and we are headed in a downhill direction, morally and spiritually, and picking up speed. Christian people know this. We don't have to belabor that point. We need to understand, however, that it's not new. 2 Timothy chapter 3 prophesied that in the last days, perilous times would come. We've been in the last days since the church began. And perilous times come again and again and again. Civilization, civilizations rise and fall. Things wax and wane. Sometimes things seem to come in, in cycles. In any society, however, I think it's fair to say that the Bible teaches the general trend of society is downward into sin and depravity. This is what happened to the Gentile world. Study Romans chapter 1 to see that. This is what Paul predicts in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13 when he said, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. John, in fact, some 20 centuries ago said the whole world lieth in wickedness. It is not a new thing. But it is also fair to say that without contradiction, our society is on a downward trend. In 1963, this was a comparison that Alan Hires drew in the uh, article that he had in that uh, spiritual sword. In 1963, Marriage was nearly universal. Divorce was rare. Now, 28% of children live in single-parent homes. Out-of-wedlock births were the exception in 1963. Today, 40% of babies are born out of wedlock.
1963, there were 18 arrests surrounding illegal drugs, manufacture or sale or use of illegal drugs. 18 arrests for 100,000 people. Now, today, well, in 2010, there were 100 per 100,000. You say, well, that doesn't sound like an awful lot. That's 550% increase, folks. Marriage was one man and one woman. Now our society cannot even define what a man and a woman is. And woe to any person who was backward and unwoke enough to suggest that there are only two genders. Now there are dangers in dwelling on these things too much. In fact, the whole thrust of these lessons is going to be about us not just facing the future, but having a winning future, a victorious future. If we dwell on the past too much, we can grow nostalgic for the good old days. We can begin to view the past with rose-colored glasses. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 10, we went over this in Gems not long ago. Bob's been teaching that class from Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 10 says, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. How many here today want to go back to the good old days of outhouses and drawing water from the well? How many want to live without electricity, without air conditioning? In 1900, life expectancy in the U.S. was 46 years for men, 48 years for women. Today, women, it's close to 81 years. Men, about 76. We're still getting a raw deal there, but... <clears throat> In 200 years, the mortality rate for children under five has fallen from 40% to 3.7%. So we could ask, do you really want to go back to the good old days? But morally and spiritually speaking, the state of our union, the condition of our world, is dark. We can say with Paul from our text, the days are evil. In Ephesians chapter 5 there. And when we look back, the downward trend becomes obvious. And we begin to grow concerned about our future, and there's another danger there. Too much focus on the future and on this downward trend of what it's going to bring will bring us great anxiety and worry. What is going to happen to this great country? I don't know. What persecutions or evils will our grandchildren have to face and deal with? I don't know. But Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 34, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We have a Savior. We have a high priest. We have a king who is always at our side and on our side. Say amen. amen. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6. He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what men shall do to me. Instead of dwelling too much on how good the past was, 
instead of trembling and making ourselves sick over an uncertain future, let's roll up our sleeves and do what we can to make today better, to make it more spiritual, to draw closer to God and closer to God's people. And let's win some souls while we're at it. Our spiritual battle is one we must not surrender and we must not fail to fight. So let's go back to our text and deal with it today. The days are evil. And evil days call first for discernment. Verse 10 in Ephesians chapter 5 says, Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. That's, that's the idea of testing things. We, we see this same idea, and I didn't put it in the chart, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, when he says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, and abstain from all appearance of evil. We're supposed to be able to, to discern between the good and the evil, between the light and the darkness. In order to live as God would have us live, to walk as he wants us to walk, to be children of light, which this text talks about, we have to be able to discern, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is this righteousness or is this evil? And we cannot, we must not try to discern these things from our own minds, from our own standards, or by the standards of this world. Of course, Proverbs 14, 12 there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And uh, Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, comes up often in my mind. He says in verse 12, writing to those people, For when for the time you ought to be teachers... Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even to them who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil." Dark days, evil days, call for discernment. And we're only going to get that spiritual discernment from God's Word. Not from anywhere else. Let's mention secondly that evil days call for distance. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 7, as he has gone through a list of, of sins that were going on in the world, he says, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. That's verse 7. In verse 8, Ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In verse 11, he says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them. We have to have distance from evil. We have to willingly eschew evil. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11 talks about if we want to love life and see good days, one of the things that we have to do is eschew evil and do good. That eschew is to draw back from, to recoil from evil, to put a distance between us and evil. We must, in fact, clean the platter inside and out. Remember Jesus' condemnation of the Pharisees in Matthew 23, that they clean, cleansed the outside, but the inside was dirty. He says there in Matthew 23 and verse 26, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Brethren, we need to make sure our hearts are pure before God. We just sang this song, Pure in Heart, O God. Did you mean it? Do you mean it when you sit down in front of the television? Do you want to be purer in heart? 
We have to distance ourselves from evil, folks. We have to not be partakers with those who are doing evil and not be in fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Let me make a suggestion to you. It's not an assignment. It's not a command. But let me make a suggestion to you that you sometime in the near future go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 beginning in verse 14 and read down through chapter 7 and verse 1. Keeping in mind here this passage in Ephesians, which is teaching us to distance ourselves from evil. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he goes on to, to describe the, the distance, the, the uh, lack of harmony that there can be between what is right and what is wrong. We have to take care regarding our companions and regarding our entertainment if we are going to distance ourselves from evil. Someone said this, and I think it's worth our thinking about. The gospel of Christ is countercultural. That is, we do not flow with the tide. We stand against the rush of cultural change. And we plant our feet upon the everlasting, unchanging truth that God has revealed to us. When we do that, we will purposely distance ourselves from evil. Number three, evil days call for diligence. The title of today's lesson is Walk Circumspectly. When we think of the word circumspectly, we think of, because it, it comes to us, uh, looking around, circum and spect, aware of what's around us. That's not really what the original word there in the, in the Greek language meant. Uh, it means the idea of perfectly, or the ESV and the ASV uh, translate that word carefully, walk carefully. Uh, Young's literal translation translates that as walk exactly. That's found here in Ephesians 5 and verse 15. See that you walk circumspectly or carefully or exactly, not as fools, but wise. And he says, redeem the time in verse 16. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. One of the most monumental changes of our age this is an object lesson, okay? Here's the object. You have to look this way. One of the most monumental changes of our time has to do with the internet, the cell phone, the tablets, the computers, the screen time, all of these things. I'm not condemning this. I carry it with me. I keep it in my pocket. When I sit down at home, I make sure it's in reach in case it rings or something, or in case I want to look something up. I'm not condemning a, a cell phone. But we need to understand that many of the changes of our society are being driven by technology. And not all of it is good. Forbes says that the average American spends 3.5 hours a day on social media. That's 1,300 hours a year. That's 25 hours per week, folks. You think about that. That's one whole day. That's actually three work days. If you work eight hours a day, three work days spent on social media. The average American spends about 58 minutes per day on Facebook. You know how easy that is to do. They have those cute little videos, and, and, and they're keeping track. And if you watch a certain number of time on that video, they're going to give you other videos just like it. Before you know it, you're hooked. Very extremely addictive. And the average American spends 58 minutes per day on Facebook. So let's take the average American starting at age 13, okay? 
and going up through 79, 67 years. During all those years, at 58 minutes per day, that would be a continuous, if we put it all together, continuous use of Facebook for over 10 years. The average person watches television out of, his, out of that lifespan about seven years and 10 months. Average person eats and drinks about three years and five months. Spends about one year and 10 months in grooming. I'd, I'd like to see a comparison between men and women on that one personally, but <clears throat> spends about one year and three months of his life socializing. About six months of his life, his or her life, mostly her, I, I think, doing laundry. I know, ladies, it seems longer than that, doesn't it? <clears throat> if we talk about spiritual things and someone that attended uh, church services, Bible classes and so forth, let's say four hours a week, giving the benefit of the doubt, and spent 15 minutes a day in Bible study, that's about two and a quarter years over your lifespan. And the average American is spending over 10 years of his life on Facebook. More than four times as much as time spent on spiritual things. Let me make a suggestion to you. I, I thought of this because I had to spend some hours recently at the Social Security office. And you're spending that, that, that's wait time, okay? That's not actually accomplishing anything. It's just wait time. And guess what everyone there was doing? Everyone there. What if, as Christian people, we decided to dedicate our wait time to Bible reading? Wherever you happen, I mean, you carry it with you anyway. You can have it easily when you're waiting in a long line, when you have downtime for whatever reason, you're at the doctor's office or whatever. What would happen if we spend our time there studying our Bibles? Again, I'm not making a command here. I'm offering a suggestion. Are we distracted by technology? Be careful in your answer. As a congregation that is made up largely of older people, many of us probably could say, not me. But then let's think about our young people. Let's think about young people who never knew what it was like to not have this. Common sense media... Talking about overall screen use. That's screens, that's television, uh, cell phones, tablets, computers, etc. Okay, Overall screen use says that screen time has increased for teenagers by 17%. For tweens by five and a half hours. Who here, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but who here has made the excuse that you don't have time for the Lord's work. Jesus said in John 9 and verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night cometh when no man can work. We need to buy back some of this time, brethren. This is the command, redeeming the time. Buy it back. Don't waste it. Use it profitably. Redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. And evil days call for diligence. And one last thing that we want to mention. Evil days call for determination. You might have decision there if you're making notes. We need the courage to call evil, evil. 
This text here in Ephesians chapter 5 teaches us to expose those works of darkness. King James Version there says reprove them, but I think a better translation, and it's, it shows in most of the translations, uh, most of the versions, is expose those evil works of darkness. In Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, we read that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. He made a decision. He made a determination. This text in Ephesians chapter 5 here is a challenge. Who are we going to be? Regardless of how the world changes, who are we going to be as Christian people? Joshua 24 and verse 15, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Are we going to be children of darkness or children of light? Are we going to be wise or unwise? Are we going to follow our hearts or follow the master? That's the choice that we have to make. And there is no room for any neutrality in this. Jesus said in Matthew 12 and verse 30, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. This lesson calls for decision. It calls for determination. Let me read you a quick poem here by John Oxenham. Think about it and think about whether you agree with it or not. He says, to every man there openeth a way. There openeth a way and ways and a way. Some men climb the highway and some men grope below. And in between the misty flats, the rest drift to and fro. And to every man there openeth a highway and a low. And every man decideth which way his soul shall go. There's some good ideas in that poem, but they don't exactly reflect Jesus' description. Jesus only talked about two ways, not a middle way. I realize the author of the poem was, was speaking against indecision about trying to be in the middle. There is no way to be in the middle, folks. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. There is no way to be in the middle. There is no neutrality. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Evil days call for discernment. And they call for us to distance ourselves from evil. They call for us to be diligent in the work of the Lord and redeem the time. Because the days are evil. To walk circumspectly or carefully because the days are evil. And evil days call for decision. This sermon calls for a decision. I don't apologize that every time I preach, I call for a decision. That's what God's Word does. You need to decide. We all need to decide. If today you are not a Christian, if you have not obeyed the plan of salvation as it is laid out in Scripture, hearing the word and, and believing it, and therefore believing in Jesus as the, the Savior, the Son of God, as Lord of this world. And because of that faith, turning away from sin, repenting of sin, and determining to try to be righteous instead of sinful, confessing your faith in Jesus Christ, and being baptized into Him, to have your sins washed away, and to be raised to walk in a new life, being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. If you haven't done that, I'm calling on you today to make a decision. 
The days are evil. As long as you don't make that decision, you are on the side of evil. I know that may not be your intention. I'm talking about the reality. He that is not with me is against me. Make a decision. Christian people, confirm your decision every day that I'm going to live closer to God today. Further from sin, shining as a light in this world. We're going to sing this invitation song. If you need to be baptized into Jesus today, if you need to come confessing wrong, won't you come as we stand and sing?